So welcome um, to this session where we are just really going to love the great books. Mr. Bring asked me to cover this topic because I ooze enthusiasm for the great books. I can't hold it in and love them to pieces. And a lot of people probably have not even ever heard that term, the great books. Uh, so if you Google it, you will find that there are lots and lots and lots of things. Nobody's list is exactly the same as somebody else's list. Um, so you're not going to find a master list of all the texts that actually belong to that title. The title started, as best I can tell, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, when publishers were really starting to produce books in mass. And one publisher got the idea of producing this masterful library that every American should have in their home. And so they started promoting this idea of a library of great books and uh, telling Americans, you know, if you want to impress your neighbor with your wit and your candor, then you need to read all of these books. And Americans, wanting to impress their neighbors, bought these books. Come on in. Uh, and they were, they were um, identical books, and you can still still find them at antique stores or flea markets. They were in little bookcases, and they just matched. Um, a lot of the books and a lot of the titles will be um, curious titles because they begin in antiquity, really with the Greeks and the Romans. And uh, they move through the Middle Ages, and then really, like I said, because it started at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, they kind of stopped, stopped there. Those types of sets of great books. Nowadays, we really use that term to use texts that are universally good and worthwhile of our attention and our instruction. For those of you who have sat through my morning with the muses, almost everybody in here has sat through my morning with the muses, I teach from a book called The Secret Garden. And it's not widely known as one of the great books, but I would call it a great book. And so I encourage you, number one, don't worry about what somebody else's list says. Um, pay attention to uh, books that are universally loved and universally worthwhile and don't get bogged down in what other people say about them because ultimately the great books are going to be books that you have a connection with and that the rest of humanity shares that connection that you have with these books. If somebody tells you that Plutarch is an incredible author and you pick up Plutarch and you go, I have absolutely no idea what this is, is saying, Plutarch still be, might be one of the great books, but that doesn't mean that you can't read the great books. Does that make sense? I have not read all of the books that are like the great books. I'm not even, like, not, probably not even the majority of them have I put eyes to. Um, and so don't, don't think that you're, if you're starting from a place where you don't have a lot of experience with them, that that's not something that you can overcome. One at a time, a little bit at a time, we engage with these things. But really the question is, why, why are they called great books? Why are these books universal texts, and, and why are they important? And when it comes down to it, they tell a continuous story. Like I said, they start in, in usually Greece and Rome. They go through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, especially, um, through industrialization and into modernity, and they tell a continuous story, and that story is the story of humanity. And that story is never going to die. These books are never going to go out of fashion. Um, they're never going to be useless books because they are always going to be important to our story. But if we neglect them, if we decide they're too hard or I can't read them, then we're the ones truly that are going to miss out. Now they're hard, and some people might say, hmm, so what? I'll, I'll miss out. That's, I don't have time. It's too much of my time. And at Trinity, we, we don't accept that. Montage. We, we really are going to say we're going to we're going to take the time to read the, the, the great books, even if we're not reading them there in their entirety. We'll read excerpts of them, but we'll at least get the flavor and the idea of them. But like I said, what really matters is the connections that can be made and the connections that you can gain from the books in order to widen your perspective. So when I was a little girl, when I was five, I think. My grandmother read me The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I'm sure most of you have heard of The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's a book by C.S. Lewis. Um, we read all of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. That happens to be the first book that he read. And you can probably tell from the title that wardrobe, a wardrobe plays a big part in the story. 
we believe that these four siblings in England find a magical land in the back of the wardrobe. And when I was five years old, I didn't recognize all of the beautiful things about that book. Again, maybe not even considered one of the great books. All I really cared about was the story. I loved the story. But that book did something to my heart and to my loves because of the way it told the story. So I would, I would be at my grandmother's house and she had three ginormous, ginormous wardrobes in her home, and I couldn't pass by one without opening up and checking for that to see if I could find my way into Narnia. And I still love wardrobes. I still think they're grand and glorious, and I still probably would open one every time I walked by it and checked. So at five years old, I made a connection with, with furniture. Like it affected my loves. It affected how I felt about this type of piece of furniture. And that's the type of things that great books do. They, they affect us to a point that they are, they're changing the way that we view the world, or that we view other people, or that we view beauty, or that we view truth, or we view goodness. You're, you hear truth, goodness, and beauty all the time in classical education, but it really, those really are those three hallmarks of, of the ultimate to strive for. And the great books always, always point to them. They always help us to understand those things. So the so what isn't just you know for us personally, but the so what, so why did we read these is really important here at Trinity. And the reason is that our aspiration here is to inspire lifelong learners. You can't read the great books from K through 12 grade. It is literally impossible. There is so much, they are so deep. They are so complex, it's impossible. So what we have to do is we have to inspire our students to have enough respect for them, to have enough connection to them that they will continue to glean from those for the rest of their lives. Even if they take their 20s off, you know, or their late 20s and 20s off, then maybe they will have a good enough view of them that they will come back to them. And the reason that it's important that they come back to them is because they live in a world, we live in a world, that is increasingly full of distraction and temptation. These good books pair back the distraction and temptation, and they boil things down to their essence. Truly, they really, really do. Um, especially because so many of them are so old. They don't involve our modern distractions. They don't involve the things that, that are very garish and bright and flashy to us. Um, rather, they are very, when we read them, because we don't know their context as well, the best that we can get out of them is the essence of them. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if we want our children to love only what is worthy of their attention, to not run after these garish distractions, we have to teach them how to love those things. And some of the, the ways that the great books do that is by pointing us to things that are lovely and things that are worthy, but also by challenging our minds to re-examine the easy things. Um, and as we as, as you move through the more complex of the great texts, your mind is even more challenged to love those lovely things and those beautiful things, those things that are harder to get. And, and when I say that, I, I really do truly mean those things that are hard to get. Things like a, a, an intimate, dear relationship. There's nothing easy about an intimate, dear relationship, but it's one of the most blessed things that you have. You don't even possess it, really, right? You just enjoy it. Um, space or the ability to commune with God. Again, not something that you possess, something that you aspire to. And so as you know, when we think about those two things, there's so much complexity that comes into how we can aspire to those things. Reading the great text and putting you through yourself through the discipline of the struggle of those things wire us to not give up when we aspire to have those lovely beautiful things and when we aspire for our children to have those lovely beautiful things. 
The other thing that they're really, really good at is giving us that it's something that we can confidently trust stands the test of time. I guess that we can confidently trust is trustworthy. And in our world today, once again, it's very concerning how many things are put and given to our students that are not trustworthy. They are not anchored or based in any sort of goodness or reality of truth as we understand truth connected and, and always tied to the person of Jesus Christ. Um, our students need to be able to discern that. And as these books have stood the test of time, they can lay them against the things that they're being given in the modern age and be able to um, rectify in their minds how well they lay out against these things. Okay, it's not. So hopefully you guys are following me. Um, when our students can confidently lay what is historically been regarded as trustworthy, it is akin to teaching them to swim before we throw them in the pool. Okay, our kids are going to end up in the pool. They are going to end up swimming on their own. And so if we can give them these tools, if we can lay these things out for them, um, and encourage them in that, encourage them in the difficulty and in the struggle, and sit down next to them and say, I know you don't want to do this, or I know this is a really hard thing to understand, but let's keep trying. Um, where we are establishing a discipline and a foundation for them to not fall into the easy things, to not succumb to the easy pleasures that life is going to throw at them. I think we can all recognize what that means in our own minds. We can all pull those things to mind, those things that easily distract us, the temptations for us as well, the scrolling on Facebook for hours or binge watching a Netflix show. And I'm not saying that those things are, you know, I'm not, I'm not calling those things evil. I'm just saying those are maybe the easier pleasures to fall into rather than the, the things that are harder to work at. When we lay these books, these great books, plus alongside the greatest book, which of course is scripture, we, we believe here at Trinity that the Bible is paramount. Um, I think, personally, I think that we are in the best possible position to help our students understand both their place in space and time. This is Gloria, my daughter. Hi, Gloria. <laughs> she she has the other instrument. <laughs> yeah, okay. So they are best able to understand, I think, where they fit in space and time and where they fit in God's purpose as well. Because the Bible informs us of God's plan for us and for all of humanity. And these great books inform us of the narrative of that history. We walk alongside that narrative of that history, and the Bible just lays right along that and says, here's where God was, and here's how he played into that. And when our students can put those two things together, all of a sudden they have this wide perspective. They have this full perspective of saying, okay, well, God says that it's important for me to love. And this book demonstrates love sacrificially in this way. And so if I look at those two things and I say, history has elevated this and has said that this is good, and God has told me that this is good, then that is something that I can aspire to. And that surely part of my purpose and part of my plan in God's world is to love sacrificial. Does that make sense? So how do these great books accomplish this magnificent feat? Because it really is a magnificent feat. It is striking. If anybody has ever tried to sit down and write something, it's daunting. And to try to write something purposeful or something that moves people is even more daunting. Um, these, these texts are unique in that they have moved people for a long time. And I think that what they hold in common, just this is for me, what I would call a great text or a great book, is one that examines what is most human, good or bad, in the world in an exemplary way. I'm going to say that again. A great book is something that examines what is most human, good or bad, in the world in an exemplary way. And so because it examines it in an exemplary way, it elevates our understanding of viewing ourselves. If 
we couldn't write that, we can at least sit alongside that author and understand their, their examination and their perspective on that piece of humanity. By speaking to the universal concerns, they speak to all of humanity. So if a text speaks about grief, whether it's 2,000 years old or 200 years old, it still speaks to humanity. And we can all learn something from that if it's done in that exemplary way. Courage, evil, you name it. There are things that we are all faced with that we all have to consider and define for ourselves as we're making our decisions. You have made the decision to educate your children in this difficult way. And that was not an easy decision to make. And it's hard sometimes, and you have to know why. It's okay, you're fine. You have to know why you're willing to do that. And that's what these texts do. They help us to examine the whys of our life. They help us to examine those deep whys of our life. Not, why did I choose to go to Wisconsin Dells for vacation? That's really not a deep why. Why would I choose to homeschool my children two weeks a week when it's hard and I cry sometimes? <laughs> That's a hard why. That's a difficult one. The other thing these books do for us, and I think for our kids, is they establish the precedents that bit by bit allow us to enjoy the freedom of making those hard choices. So we live in, arguably, but I mean, pretty certainly, the freest, richest society that's ever existed on the face of the earth. We, we enjoy tremendous luxury in our lives and our time right now. But without Plato's Republic, we wouldn't have a government in this country that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Truly, we wouldn't. Our founding fathers were so shaped by what Plato said and what Plato learned and what he communicated that they formed and formatted our government to reflect it. Shakespeare, we've all heard of Shakespeare, is responsible for immeasurable changes in the way we communicate. He literally rewrote the English language, truly, in the, in the 16th century. Do you want to guess how many classical allusions Shakespeare has in his plays? There are 11 in Othello, there are 25 in Romeo and Juliet, there are 37 in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Altogether, we're in the thousands of classical allusions. Now, we would consider Shakespeare to be a great author, but how influenced was he by the classical authors who came before him to then change the way that we say, it's all Greek to me? That's Shakespeare's words, and we all use it. Dante's Inferno revolutionized the way people interacted with scripture and the church, leading to the Reformation. Dante was influenced by Virgil. Virgil had been who idolized Homer. All of these great books, all of these pieces, work in a ladder. And when we understand more of the ladder, we understand more of who we are and we understand more of ourselves. That's why I said these great books examine the very best and worst of humanity. And when, when they are elevated to the point that Thomas Jefferson is referencing them in the Declaration of Independence, or John Adams is using them as he writes the Constitution, for us to know that we're Americans, it's important to know where that came from and the things and the liberties that we hold dear came from. Then we know who we are. And that came from these great books. So we're going to talk a little bit about Homer. Our kids read Homer in this school. That's one of the great books that we do not let them get out of. Homer is an 8th century BC Greek citizen. He wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. Raise your hand if you've read either the Odyssey or the Iliad in your life. Okay. Did you like it? No, no. Okay. I you did like it. I, I, when, I, when I did this for Moses and I did my test on Moses, he goes, yes! And I was like, oh, honey, you come to class. Because <laughs> you can say yes. And everybody else says yes. So I have a yes. Um, the Odyssey and the Iliad are difficult texts. 
they're epic poems, uh, but they are very important. We were talking about that they're important because people are still reading them. So they were written 3,000, almost 3,000 years ago, the Odyssey and the Iliad were written. And that's not an insignificant number. I'm not throwing that number out there. Like, 3,000 years ago, you have to think about that, okay? Can anybody name a Nobel or Pulitzer Prize winning author of the 1920s? Nobel or Pulitzer Prize winning, the highest prizes offered to our writers in the, in the world. Can anybody name a winner of the 1920s? Anybody guess that winner of the 1920s? Huh? Uh, Fitzgerald didn't win, but that's a really good guess. It was written in the 1920s. I looked him up to make sure I knew in case somebody guessed. I don't have them all memorized. Okay, that's a hundred years ago, you guys. A hundred years ago, and we don't remember the names of the authors that won these prizes. This was written 3,000 years ago, and we are still calling it good. Nobody is going to be remaking Dodgeball or Anchorman or carving your hallmark inscription in stone in 3,000 years. But guess what? In 3,000 years, people are still going to be reading more. And that in and of itself should inspire us to say, why? What is in that book that is so compelling that we want to learn what is said there? And part of it is the history. Part of it is the fact that Homer kind of turned the world on, the, on his head when he wrote this. Do you know that people memorized this? That's how this was retold. For like a thousand years, it was retold in verse. People memorized the Iliad and the Odyssey and retold it over and over and over again. We have a verbal continuity to this story. You guys, like, seriously, we can't memorize this today. But they found this so valuable. You know what else has a verbal record of continuity? Genesis. We don't know the earliest text of Genesis was written down, but we know that it was remembered verbally first. These texts are super important, and they are important for us to know. So let's talk a little bit about the Iliad. I'm going to read to you from the Iliad. Reading out loud is one of my favorite things to do, so you guys are just going to have to bear with me. Um, so we have some people who have read the Iliad. Would anybody like to give us a synopsis of the story of how the Iliad begins? Do I have to bring Moses back in here? He was so good. <laughs> okay, so the Iliad is a story that centers around the Trojan War. For those of you who have had students at Trinity Academy, we say Trojan. In war in our history timeline, and it is circa 1180 BC. Is that right, Mr. Williamson? That's correct. Trojan War, like a running horse. Trojan War, circa 1180 BC, right? The Trojan War took place between the, the Greeks and the city of Troy, and the Iliad tells us that it started because who made the golden apple? I, there was a golden apple. And on the golden apple was inscribed to the most beautiful. And Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena, three goddesses, were arguing over whose apple it should be. They all thought it should be theirs. And I can't remember who, but somebody picked Paris, the handsomest man on earth, to decide who got the golden apple. And Paris, was offered to rule, Moses told me this, so hopefully he was right, to rule all of Asia by Hera. Hera was going to give him all of Asia. Uh, Athena told him she would make him the wisest man. Is that right? Gosh, I need Moses. And Aphrodite told him that she would give him the most beautiful woman on earth and make her fall in love with him. That's not right. And so what does Paris, as a man, choose? What do you think? He chooses the woman. He absolutely chooses the woman. So he says to Aphrodite, here's your golden apple. I'll take the most beautiful woman in the world, please. And in the process, he takes off Hera and Athena, who are now fighting against him with the Trojans. 
So Aphrodite goes and she gets the most beautiful woman, whose name is Helen, brings Paris to Helen, makes Helen fall in love with Paris, and Helen flies away with Paris. There's one problem, Helen is married. Helen is married to a very great man, Menelaus, Melanus, I don't know. Menelaus. Menelaus, thank you very much, Menelaus. Menelaus wants his wife back. Goes to his brother Agamemnon, and off they go to siege the walls of Troy and recover Helen from Paris, who has stolen her, who has been given her by the gods. Thus, the Trojan War. Here we have two sides battling it out. These guys aren't leaving without Helen, and these guys aren't giving Helen up. And here we have a war. Now, while the Iliad centers on the Trojan War, the Iliad is about people, not about war itself. And we were just talking about how the great books tell a story and we can connect to them, but that they also examine what is most important about humanity, right? What's most human in the world. This is what Caroline Alexander, who translated the Iliad recently said. The Iliad is actually saying something true about a dimension of our life that will always matter and particularly mortality as it is most exposed, which is in time of war. Once again, the Iliad is actually saying something true about a dimension of our life that will always matter, particularly mortality as it is most exposed, which is in time of war. The Iliad is not about war itself, it's about people. Then it must be about the people and characters found within the story that are just like the people and characters in our lives. Every war, every town has the wise and the foolish, and the lover and the noble and the base. Do you have a question? So read that again. One more time. Thing true about it is it. actually saying something true about a dimension of our life that will always matter. And particularly mortality as it is most exposed, which is in times of So those people and those characters in this book are archetypes. We are to look at them and we are to see ourselves in them or our neighbors in them. We're to recognize characteristics that help us understand humans, help us understand our neighbors. And the millions of humans throughout history who have struggled, sorry, experienced struggles, made choices, and fought wars can learn and have learned from this text. When one land fights another land, whether they are shooting arrows or missiles, whether they are driving chariots or Humvees, fun fact, there is a Humvee turn signal on my shelf over there somewhere. My husband got for me when he was in the brain turn. Whether they're driving chariots or Humvees, there is sorrow in loss of life. And there is weariness in times of war as the time drags on. Because even victory feels inadequate. The word victory feels inadequate at the end of a war because is there ever truly a winner? Is there a victor in a war? War is complex and difficult. And the Marvel movies lie. And Disney does too, quite honestly. Those endings are not true endings. They are not what life looks like. So these great texts are going to give us a picture into what life really looks like. One of the characters that we find in the Iliad is a warrior named Hector. Hector is a hero in every sense of the word. His only problem in the book is he happens to be the brother of Paris, who stole Helen. Hector loves his brother, and he loves his city. He is a son of Troy. And he is an honorable man. And I'm going to read you in just a minute a little bit about Hector. So when Agamemnon shows up with all of his armies and his very interesting characters, Achilles and Odysseus, who are also great warriors and also very flawed and full of pride, and we get to learn a lot about them too, what is Prince Hector to do but to fight to defend his home and his family? So here, we know how this war started, right? Who's the bad guy? 
Who are the bad guys? The guy who stole the wife, right? Hector's on the bad side. Or is he on the bad side? Because Agamemnon is a jerk. And so is Achilles. Wait till you read about them. They are not nice in any sense of the word. Truly. But let's, let's read a little about Hector. Let's see if Hector's nice. This is Hector's wife speaking to him before he heads out into the battle. She says to him, pity me, please. Just take your stand on the rampart here before you orphan your son and make your wife a widow. Draw up your armies where the wild fig tree stands there, where the city lies most open to assault, the walls lower, easily overrun. Three times they have tried that point, hoping to storm Troy, by their best fighters led. Perhaps a skilled prophet revealed the spot, or their own fury whips them on to attack. They can't take that spot. Those Greeks have not seemed to have been able to take down the forces of Troy at that particular spot. So she says, just go fight there. Keep your stronghold. And tall Hector nodded, his helmet flashing. All this weighs on my mind too, dear woman. But I would die of shame to face the men of Troy and the Trojan women trailing their long robes if I would shrink from battle now a coward. Nor does the spirit urge me on that way. I've learned it all too well. To stand up bravely, always to fight in the front ranks of, Tro ranks of Trojan soldiers, winning my father great glory, glory for myself. For in my heart and soul I also know this well. The day will come when sacred Troy must die. Priam must die and all his people with him. Priam who hurls the strong spear. Even so, it is less the pain of the Trojans still to come that weighs me down. Not even King Priam or the thought of my own brothers and all their numbers and all their gallant courage may tumble in the dust crushed by enemies. That is nothing, nothing beside your agony, my wife. When some brave, brazen Argive hails you off in tears, wrenching you away from your day of light and freedom. Then far off in the land of Argos you must live, laboring at a loom at another woman's beck and call, fetching water at some spring the rough yoke of necessity at your neck. And a man may say who sees your streaming tears, there is the wife of Hector, the bravest fighter they could feel, those stallion-breaking Trojans, long ago when the men fought for Troy. So he will say, and the fresh grief will swell in your heart once more, widowed, robbed of the one man strong enough to fight off your day of slavery. No, no, let the earth come piling over my dead body before I hear your cries and I hear you dragged away. In the same breath shining, Hector reached down for his son, but the boy recoiled, cringing against his nurse's breast, screaming out at the sight of his own father, terrified by the flashing bronze, the horsehair crest, the great ridge of the helmet nodding, bristling terror, so it struck his eyes. And his loving father laughed. His mother laughed as well, and glorious Hector, quickly lifting the helmet from his head, set it down on the ground, fiery in the sunlight. Raising his son, he kissed him, tossed him in his arms, lifting a prayer to Zeus and the other deathless gods. Zeus, all you immortals, grant this boy my son may be like me, first in glory among the Trojans, strong and brave, and rule all Troy in power. And one day let them say he is a better man than his father. When he comes home from battle bearing the bloody care of the mortal enemy he has killed in war, a joy to his mother's heart. So Hector prayed and placed his son in the arms of his loving wife. She pressed the child to her scented breast, smiling through her tears. Her husband noticed, filled with pity now, Hector stroked her gently, trying to reassure her, repeating her name, dear one, why so desperate? Why so much grief for me? No man will hold me down to death against my fate. Fate, no one alive has escaped it. Neither brave man nor coward, I tell you. It's born with us the day we are born. Go home. Go home and tend your tasks. The distaff and the loom and keep the women working hard as well. As for the fighting, then we'll see to that. All who were born in Troy, but I most of all. Homer uses everything he has to paint a picture of this relationship. He writes beautifully of this, of this bond this man and this woman and this child. And he gives us Hector's 
noble spirit. I will not turn away even though you ask me. And, and doesn't this call to mind as we read this, the pictures of, of World War II and the Civil War and men leaving their wives to go and defend what? To defend their homes? To defend that which, which, is, which is right and noble and true to them? This is a, this is a universal theme that, that Hector is, is displaying for us, and we admire his high character, right? How would we feel if he, in a cowardly way, said to her, you're right, let's sneak out the back. I'll live to see another day, and would I will just leave. We wouldn't admire that. This wouldn't be an admirable text if that was Hector's choice, and it wasn't Hector's choice. And what that does for us as we're reading this text is when we come to Hector's death, spoiler alert, Hector's going to die. It makes it all the more tragic for us, doesn't it? Because we're just not weeping over Hector the warrior, who we hear all about him as a warrior, and he is spectacular. Marvel's got nothing on this guy, I'm telling you. He is unbelievable the way his, his men follow him, and they listen to him, and they admire him and he uses his brains as well as his brawn. Man, Hector is, he's tremendous in who he is. And so when he dies, it's not for the loss of a great warrior that we need, is it? It's for the connection to his family. And we know his wife has begged him not to go, and he has said, what will we will be home? And let me go do what I need to be doing, what we do here to do. On the battlefield, Hector comes face to face with Achilles, and Achilles is the greatest warrior. Everybody knows Achilles is the greatest warrior. Achilles is half god, so he has a bit of a, an advantage over Hector. But remember, too, that Hector has Aphrodite on his side because she won the golden apple, but Achilles has both Hera and Athena on his side. So it's kind of an unfair battle. Achilles also is ripped with pride. He is so full of himself that he can't even stand straight. In fact, he refuses to even go to battle for a long period of time because nobody asks him the right way. And when he finally does go to battle, that's who kills our beloved Hector, Achilles. <laughs> Struggling for breath, Hector, his helmet flashing, says to Achilles, I beg you, Beg you by your life, your parents, don't let the dogs devour me by the ships. Wait, take the princely ransom of bronze and gold, the gift, the gifts my father and noble mother will give you. But give my body to my friends to carry home again. So Trojan men and Trojan women can do me honor with fitting rites of fire once I am dead. Staring grimly, the proud runner Achilles answered, Beg no more, you fawning dog. Beg me by my parents. Would to God my rage and my fury would drive me now to hack your flesh away and eat you raw. Such agonies you have caused me. Ransom? No man alive could keep the dog packs off you. Not if they haul it in 10, 20 times that ransom and pile it here before me and promise me fortunes more. No, not even Priam should offer to weigh out your bulk and gold. Not even then will your noble mother lay on you, lay you on your deathbed. More in the sun she bore, the dogs and birds will rend you, blood and bone. At that point of death, Hector, his helmet flashing, said, I know you well. I see my fate before me. Never a chance that I could win you over. Iron inside your chest, that part of yours. But now beware, or curse will draw God's wrath upon your head. That day when Paris and Lord Apollo, for all your fighting heart, destroyed you at the gates. And then death cut him short. And closed in around him, flying free of his limbs, his soul went winging down to the Hades of death, wailing his fate, leaving his manhood far behind. His young and supple strength, but brilliant Achilles, taunted Hector's body, dead as he was. Die, die. For my own death, I'll meet it freely, whenever Zeus and the other deathless gods would bring it on. And with that, he wrenched his bronze spear from the corpse, laid it aside, and ripped the bloody armor off the back. And the other sons of Achaia, running up around him, crowding closer, all of them gazing, wonderstruck at the build, marvelous lie of beauty of Hector. And not a man came forward who did not stab his body, 
glancing at a comrade laughing. Ah, look here, how much softer he is to handle now, this Hector, than when he gutted our ships with roaring fire. Not only is Hector dead, Hector's body is brutalized. And after this, they drag him around the city to make sure every person can see that their prince is dead. And his mother wails from the top of the, of the walls. His father wails from the top of the walls. And his wife learns at home that her husband is dead. And he's never coming home. And we have lost this tremendous character. We lost this tremendous man who really is the only one that we absolutely like, except for maybe Odysseus. We like Odysseus too, but Hector is even better. Odysseus is, is smart and we admire him. Hector has power and he has courage. And so we mourn his loss alongside his parents and his father eventually just overcome with grief decides to go to Achilles and beg for his body. Alone. The king of Troy disguises himself and sneaks in. So Priam goes to Achilles, and we know what we're expecting, right? Achilles just screamed at Hector as he was dying, had no mercy. So what is he going to do for his ancient father who can't, who can't fight? Priam begs him, remember your own father, great Achilles. As old as I am, past the threshold of deadly old age. No doubt the countrymen round him plague him now with no one there to defend him. No one, but at least he hears you're still alive, and his old heart rejoices. Hope rising day by day to see his beloved son come sailing home from Troy. But I, dear God, my life so cursed by fate, I fathered here of sons in the wide realms of Troy, and now not a single one is left. I tell you, fifty sons I had. Many, most of them led by violent deaths. Ares cut the knees out from sun, but one was left to me to guard my walls, my people. The one who killed the other day, defending his fatherland, my Hector. It's all for him I've come to the ships now to win him back from you. I bring a priceless ransom. Revere the gods Achilles and pity me in my own right. Remember your own father. I deserve more pity. I have endured what no one on earth has ever done. I put my lips to the hands of the man who killed my son. Now, this is huge. He is a king and he is bowing himself before his son's killer. And we have learned of Achilles' character through this entire story that he's an extremely prideful man. And he only respects and responds to pride in turn. This man is showing humility. The opposite of what usually turns Achilles. Achilles is usually not the this. But what happens? These words stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve his own father. Taking the old man's hand, he gently moved him back, and overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam leapt freely for the man killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet, as Achilles wept himself, now for his father. And their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. Then when brilliant Achilles had had his fill of tears, and a longing for it had left his mind and body, he rose from his seat, raised the old man by the hand, and filled with pity for his gray head and gray beard, he spoke out winging words, lying straight to the heart. Poor man, how much you mourn to break the spirit. Spirit, what daring brought you down to the ships all alone to face the glance of the man who killed your son? You have a heart of iron. And he goes on and eventually he decides, I will give you the body of your son back. You may have it. And Achilles now bears the brunt and the wrath of his own side for giving up the prize of Hector's body. And so what we've just examined, this is we've read six pages of this book. And where, what have we run through? We have run through a noble character filled with courage. We've learned of his love and his relationship for his wife and his son. We've heard him die nobly, and we've seen evil on the other side of the spear in Achilles. But then, but then we've seen redemption. We've seen Achilles' father go and humble himself. And that humility turned Achilles, sorry, 
Priam goes and humbles himself before Achilles, and that humility is what turns Achilles' heart to say, okay, you can have, you can have your son back. When Homer wrote this, most Greek plays and stories uh, ended with a god swooping in and saving the day. The god came in and they all lived happily ever after, or at least the god lived happily ever after. And the hero was a hero, Hercules, Jason, and the Argonauts. What Homer gives us is a tragic hero. And this is very significant because heroes don't die, right? Homer gives us a weak hero because this Hector did die. He wrote about, wrote, about, wrote about a man who rose above his peers to sacrifice himself for the good of those he loved. He knew that he was going to die. He foretold his own death, but he knew that that was his calling. And he wrote, Homer writes about that loss in such a way that it changes the hearts of those within the city and it changes the heart of the enemy who even took the life of that hero. Can anybody think of another weak hero who rises above his peers and sacrifices himself and changes the hearts of those immediately around him, but also changes the hearts of those who call who was called his enemies? Christ. Absolutely. Hector is written before Christ lives is a Christ-like figure for us to contemplate and for us to think about. And so if I was teaching this book to your children, which I eventually probably will, we, had, we, would, we would sit down in that section in the comfy chairs and we would ask these questions. How is Hector's sacrifice like the one Jesus made? How is it different? Should Jesus have had the same reaction from those he left behind as Hector did? Did he have the same reaction? Would he have wanted the same reaction? Contrast Jesus' motives with Hector. How are they similar? How are they different? Could you lay down your life sacrificially? What's worth it? What's worth it to you? How does Christ ask us to lose our lives? and to put our duty before our wife and our child. Do you see what I mean by this makes us examine the best of humanity and the worst of humanity? We can't get away from it when we read texts like this. Remember, here we go, Caroline Alexander. It is saying something true about a dimension of our life that will always matter. And it will always matter to any human who ever lives. For almost 3,000 years, people have wept when Hector died. At Trinity Academy, our 10th graders have the opportunity to join that chorus of history. Will they all resound with this story? No, probably not. Even if I read it to them like that, they probably will not all love it. But they'll remember it. When somebody makes an offhand comment about a Trojan horse, They'll know what that means. Truly, they'll know what that means. Nobody will have to explain it to them. When Troy is referenced somewhere, or Achilles' pride is referenced somewhere, they'll really understand what that means. And when the passion scriptures of Jesus' death at Easter are read, it will be hard for them to not recall Hector's bruised and abused body that could not be awakened that could not be resurrected. They live alongside Hector, and they weep alongside Hector's sacrifice. And how much more poignant does that make Christ to them? Because he can defeat them. He's more than a Hector. He's God. The great books always point us to truth. They always illuminate truth for us. And that's why they're worthy of our study and attention. So, I would encourage you to encourage your children as they do these times. They really are. Tell them not to give up. And, you know, better yet, read them from silence. Truly, sit down next to them and say, this is worth my time too. And I am willing to read it alongside you.